Great. Nice to meet you. Robert, did you say your name and outlet for me? Sure. My name is Robert Trey from mania.com. Okay. Uh, Carl, uh, in chapter four of your original book from the 75, I don't know if the chapters changed. Yeah, no, the chapters are all, all the same. Uh, the chapter called Let's Make It Real Compared to What? We talk about artists and engineers, craftsmen of the time being an older breed. How do you feel about now, about those craftsmen in 2012 where everything is so computer generated and digital? Well, they, they're, they, you know, they're working with a different skill set. They're working with computer analogs for live action, and they, uh, they're faced with a different set of problems. I mean, they, they're faced with getting fires to look like fires and not, you know, superimposed. They're, they're, they've got to make adjustments for wind and weather that in, quote, real life, you just film it. They have to create every frame uh, essentially from pixels. Uh, and yet, the illusion that they're struggling to achieve is the same thing, a heightened depiction of reality that an audience will accept as a believable version of the reality that they live in. Uh, the set of expectations I think that's created by modern special effects is uh, I think a great disappointment to every kid who straps on a cape and jumps off a roof or does, tries to do a karate spin kick and expects to slow down halfway through the kick and then finish, you know, real life doesn't work like that. And as we see from jackass, uh, the results are sometimes, you know, really unpleasant. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the hardest part of, of, of modern special effects is making them not seem like special effects. I mean, we admire them for being special effects. We go, oh, look at that enormous thing settling on Manhattan. But nobody's ever seen anything like that. So we don't know if it's right or not. So we have to suspend disbelief. Uh, I think there's a lot of money to be made by the first CGI special effects film that uses the genius of the special effects guys to create realistic episodes uh, that are shocking to an audience that believes, well, shit, that could happen. I mean, any, anybody who's ever been in a car crash knows that it's not like the movies. And anybody who's ever pushed a car off a cliff for fun knows that they don't automatically burst into flames when they hit the bottom. And yet, the Hollywood convention is all cars burst into flames. Well, watch NASCAR for a weekend. You'll see cars hitting the wall at 200 miles an hour. And you know what? They don't burst into flames. And they're running on nitromethane. You know, so uh, we've created a new reality that exists only in the theater. And to the degree that entertainment is supposed to re reflect reality and make us think about it, I think we're, we're letting the audience down, if, if you want my whole opinion on that. <laughs> uh, in your book, you talk about the duality of being both the screenwriter and the actor. Uh, so what was the hardest part for you to write yourself out of, the hardest scene to write yourself out of? Uh, the, the discovery of the boat, of the Ben Gardner's head. That was originally a daytime scene in which I was present and instrumental and reached out and pulled the boat you know, alongside. And when we filmed it, I fell in the water and ruined the take and had to be dried out before we could continue. And then rather than continue, we decided, you know, this might play better at night. And we thought about it, so well, okay, we'll work on this scene, we'll come back to it. And as a writer, I realized, you know what, we're probably not going to come back to it. We're probably going to do it a different way. And as an actor, you heave a sigh and go, ah, it, was, it was a good part, now it's, now it's less. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, directors like Eli Roth, Steven Sodenberg, Brian Singer, citing your book as almost their first guide 
guidebook or a first move, make a movie textbook as their inspiration? I'm 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 flattered because what I was trying to do in the book is a you know tell the story of the making of the film, but put it in context, and that meant you know little mini lessons in movie making. You know how call sheets came to be why scenes are either night or day and not in between, why there's a certain method to Hollywood's madness. Uh, you know, movies weren't invented overnight. We came to what we do now over, you know, a hundred years of history, and there are very few problems that someone hasn't faced in decades past. So in my attempt to put the process of making Jaws into the larger context of making movies, uh, I took time out to explain things as entertainingly as I could, and that attracted a lot of young readers and, and a lot of people who became filmmakers because they got a glimpse of that. And to tell the truth, when I was a kid, I read a, a piece in The New Yorker by Lillian Roth called, uh, it, was, it was on the making of The Red Badge of Courage, John Huston film with Audie Murphy. And that was kind of my model it was th because it was classic New Yorker reportage of a difficult film, a, diff a difficult shoot, a genius director, John Huston. And I said, geez, you know, if I could do something like that, that would, that would make me very happy. So that's, uh, that's, that's the model I followed. And I, and I recommend that book to anybody who's interested in books about movies. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.